Hi everyone, this is Derek Harp, the founder and chairman of the Control System Cybersecurity Association International, or as we call it, just CSEC. CSE is a 501c6 nonprofit workforce development association dedicated to helping grow, support, and sustain the professionals charged with the cybersecurity of control systems. We're specifically talking about those systems that have pumps and valves and actuators, real cyber to physical moving parts, and control nearly every aspect of our modern connected industries. Thank you for tuning into the podcast. It is my hope you find it inspirational or motivating or revealing or informative, and perhaps at times even a little entertaining. Take care and be well. Hi, this is Derek Harp, the founder and chairman of CSA and the host of the CSA podcast show. And I've got another uh, great episode in store for you today in my series of interviewing all kinds of different cyber cybersecurity leaders in our industry. And uh, if you don't know my uh, guest, Mike Radigan, he's a cyber risk advisor at Cisco, but he's held a lot of different roles, which we'll talk about. He is not only sort of formative training many years ago, electrical engineer, uh, he is a definite problem solver and known to be creative. Uh, he is an educator. He is a con definite consummate networker and connector, if you know his business of security events in Ohio. Um, he is uh, also a, a semi-retired basketball player in that he used to play a lot of basketball and doesn't play it anymore. Uh, he's a cigar enthusiast. He's a dog lover. He is an all-around good guy and somebody I've had the pleasure of knowing for many years, stemming from my years when I lived, uh, lived in central Ohio as well. So, uh, Mike, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks, Derek. I've been looking forward to this. I think this is my first official podcast I've ever participated in, so I'm All right. happy to be here. Yeah, this is going to be fun. Okay, excellent. Well, welcome to podcast land. Uh, you know, a couple of years ago, I hadn't done much with them either, but now I think we're we're approaching 90 episodes or so, and I'll have to figure out what the 100th, uh, 100th episode is going to be, so it's like a park vacation. So, well, you know, Mike, I am pretty predictable in a couple aspects of my of my show format, and it is to to make the joke about superheroes always having backstories, and cybersecurity people are a kind of modern day superhero. So, what's the backstory? Where where'd you come from? Yeah, so uh, as you know, as as you mentioned, uh, I live in Columbus, Ohio, but I grew up in the east side of Cleveland, a place called Cleveland Heights, which at one point was called the All American City. Uh, it's a bygone era, Derek. You know, so I, I'm I'm not shy about giving my age. I'm going to be 65 in October. And if you look at my LinkedIn profile, you can see when I graduated from high school, I'm proud of my age. So, but it was uh, a time when you know, the average size family was five kids and your kids out the back door, you play in the yard. And I was part of the, the Catholic school system. And so you had 40 kids in the classroom and the, the nuns were, you know, towing the line, slapping your wrist. <laughs> Somehow I made it out of there right left handed. I I I, I didn't you know get, get swatted for that, but uh, very much a a time when the blue collar worker could afford a home and support a family. And most mothers were at home looking out the kitchen window, to make sure we didn't get in too much trouble. <laughs> yeah, and it was what the, the rules were. You know, come in when it uh, when it gets dark or whatever. It would, other than that, see it. <laughs> That's right. Street lights come on. It's time to go yeah. home. Yeah, uh, for sure. So. Sure. Well, I uh, I grew up in the Midwest as well. Maybe a uh, I don't know how many you know, hundred miles from where 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 uh, where you were. I think uh, right on the Ohio border. But uh, I know that uh, sort of that that same seam is re reminiscent of my own childhood. What was your early interest, if any, in technology, or what did you think you were going to do? Uh, I know you went on to get oh. electrical engineering degree. Was that what led to that? Yeah. So I'm also a father of six children, and you know, you can see tendencies in a very early age with kids. And so, yeah, I think we could have predicted the profession uh, most of our kids ended up in. And so as I reflect back, I I like to keep stats. I was like, uh, when it comes to baseball, I wanted to see um, if the, the averages worked out. So I'd keep stats for baseball games, you know, and I was always good at math. And so... And I had this curiosity about, you know, the, uh, you know, I guess the dinosaurs and mysteries. And I wanted to get a, a metal detector, you know, so I'd go on treasure hunt. So those are the things that fascinated me as a kid. And really, um, the guidance of my mother led me into this field of, uh, you know, applying my gifts to uh, problem solving, you know, mathematics. She, she worked of all places. She had a job at Bailey Controls. Bailey Meter was called, and and that's you know got a that was the 
power generation, you know, control system of of the era, right? It was like 90% of coal plants had Bailey controls in them. And so my mother took me um, as, I think I was a sophomore in high school, and she took me in to meet the engineers. And she said, these are the guys that make the money. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right? You want to be an engineer. Yeah. So I would say oh, that. Her she, hand, it worked. I know. How about that? Yeah. So it, uh, it, it was, uh, you know, her guidance really that led me and encouraged me to continue down this path of preparing to go into, you know, a you know, electrical engineering program and be able to succeed at it. So, yeah, I'd, I'd say that, uh, and the, really the first introduction to technology was probably my freshman year of college. Yeah, so what did, uh, what did you end up, uh, you know, deciding to do first um, after graduating with that degree? So I, I graduated in 1982, and that was the last Great Recession, uh, just sometimes was referred to back uh, when we had our, our last Great Recession. Uh, so uh, it was a little tough to get a job, but I, uh, you know, it's funny, you look back and you see where, um, you know, your, your career path could have gone one way or another. I, would, I went through three interviews at CompuServe, and mm -hmm. I had... Um, the privilege of at Ohio State Electrical Engineering, they had a microcomputer lab. So they were running courses on the machine level programming. And I was actually very good at it. And it was kind of that problem solving skill again. So I was interviewing for a position to connect microcomputers to you know their service. And uh, by the time I got through the third interview, they decided to uh, disband that particular uh, position. And so I ended up taking a position with Pioneer Communications, which was producing the, um, the two-way cable plant for the Warner Amex uh, cable systems. So if, since you were from Columbus, you probably had the Warner Q box, right? I don't know, is that something that you recall? Well, I moved, I moved to Columbus uh, after my military service, so I didn't grow up there. So I didn't get there till late 90s, so I had... Nice. I want to say Comcast. Would, would Comcast been my provider by then? I don't know. You know, it was Roadrunner. So many times. It's hard to remember. <laughs> anyway, it was the most advanced cable plants in the country because they were two-way. Yeah. So there was audience participation. And so I came out as an application engineer. I supported the sales staff. And so a really interesting thing happened there is the, the Japanese came in one day with all this equipment. And it was... Uh, you know, it was CSMA CD communications equipment. Does that ring a bell with you? CSMA CD? Ah. So that's essentially Ethernet. So it's, you know, carrier sense multiple detection with collision detection, multiple access with collision detection. And they were going to install that in Columbus, you know, as the, it's really the forerunner of what we have today for as internet service across the cable plant. Yeah. So that was a fascinating place to, uh, you know, get introduced to essentially data communications so yeah so that's so there's your uh i guess that's where the the technology part comes when you know i always am curious when security first comes up i know for some time now probably close to 20 years security has been formally part of roles you've taken that's but true so before that you know before you know you were at cisco many years ago and you're back at cisco now <laughs> uh, but, but that role a long time ago was was security uh, oriented. If I remember right, what predates that, and when did security yeah. come into play? Well, you know, something else I mentioned is when uh, in the late '90s I was um, selling uh, and and sometimes designing um, we'll call it layer one, layer two, you know, cable plants for Ethernet networks. Yeah. And I was in every Owens Corning roofing plant fiberglass plant, um, you know, asphalt plant, putting in, um, designing the Ethernet network because they were going to SAP. And that was my first introduction really to control systems and how disconnected they were from everything and how they were getting connected. And uh, there was no mention of security in that process at all. Uh, well, that, this so, is great, so you're the convergence, because I asked about that road, yours was really, 
was technology and then OT. You were looking at the operating technology. Security yet hadn't yet intersected. It came later. That's right. Um, it did. And you're talking okay. about the first the first convergence is a term I know some some uh, uh, colleagues of mine hate, but <laughs> the way I think the term means that you were you're talking about looking at probably some of the very earliest uh, industrial convergence. Like here here are these connections being made that weren't there before. Absolutely, and of course we were putting in the switches as well. And it, and what happened after that? We you know didn't have the expertise to know, it, and we weren't paid to care. Uh, very it'd be interesting to know some, uh, you know who at the head end of all that was ensuring that the uh, yeah those uh, network devices weren't uh, either the source of or the recipients of some sort of malware. But I don't know if that was such a big concern back then. It, it, you know, I think our first little uh, viruses were springing up back in the late 90s, right? And so there was a little bit of a concern, but uh, it was that it was during that period where uh, a colleague of my sales colleague stole the first firewall. And that was the first time I knew of anything regarding security. And then um, then I, I moved up, I went to work for what is now called Logicalist. And um, even though I lived in Columbus, I was opening up their Northeast Ohio market. And I found that cybersecurity was kind of the buzz in 2000, 2001. And so we began repping internet security systems, ISS, you know, NetScreen, we were my yeah. two primary, you know, tip of the spear to go in and uh, open up new accounts. Of course, I could sell the entire portfolio of, you know, IT infrastructure, but uh, that's where I began to Begin my cybersecurity journey. Joined the ISSA here in Columbus. That's where I met Jack Jones. So anyway, that's where the story began. Was just from a again, you know, this is another problem to solve. How do you get access to corporate accounts when uh, you know you need to uh, get introduced and 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 get through the the barriers uh, you know that might be between you and a CISO. If there were CISOs and uh, cybersecurity was the way in. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I don't recall exactly when you and I met. I moved uh, my first startup to Columbus, Ohio in 1998. And yeah. uh, so you're looking at security already. And that's what that startup was focused on was cybersecurity. So uh, we were, uh, you know, destined to meet some, sometime, uh, you know, in that, in that time frame or within a few years, I guess. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It was, um, yeah, the ISSA back then, in, in, the Information System Security Association, if people aren't familiar with it, formed in the early 90s. There was only about 20 people in that group at the time. So it definitely was the, you know, the formation years of the profession and people, you know, getting together. And what I noticed about the profession itself that really attracted me was, and this may sound a little corny, but they were like patriots. These were the good guys, you know? And, they had a mission greater than IT infrastructure. They were protecting the enterprise, and that appealed to me. Uh, and so I, I really appreciated the community, and it's been a career move. You know, I've, I've remained in the cybersecurity industry uh, since then, since 2000. Yeah, I mean, uh, Cisco, you know, um, security business consultant, uh, Next Defense, working working with me years ago, uh, Risk Lens, uh, ABB, Senior Advisor, Cybersecurity Risk Management, Lidos, Capgemini, Caterpillar, um, uh, and Business of Security, your own, uh, you know, sort of um, organization you've had for, you know, I don't know, 15 years, and now back at Cisco, and it's all been cyber then, all those years. Oh, um, so. And and that's you know that's a long time that's that, that's a lot of development within the cybersecurity industry from like you said early days to you know to where it is today. Yeah, you know, for the most part, I was on the we'll call it the sell side of the table, and what I tuned into uh, very early was, hey, I um, the budget that I want for this security product is competing for budget from the IT. Evolution. It was always an evolution going on in IT. You know, there was a, always a, you know, a another way to um, improve efficiencies or enter a new market, or what have you. And uh, you know, what I was selling wasn't enabling a business initiative. It was a cost center, and that's a uh, always a barrier. I think even today for yeah. getting projects or initiatives funded. And so. 
that was another problem to solve. So how can I produce a business case that's as compelling, or at least can compete with these IT security projects? And so, so I invested quite a bit of time in solution selling methodologies and got sure. familiar with, yeah. I've got that book and, on my shelf right, right over there. <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's funny that the delivery room sales is find the pain. Do they, you know, have money? Can they make a decision? You know, the one call close sort of thing. In the technology sales, you've got to be a solution seller. It's not a one call close. You've, once you get the technical buyer to say, wow, I really want this, then they have to get the funding and you have to help them. And so that that was probably my professional development. What I invested time in personally was how to make the business case for cybersecurity solutions. That was what I invested a, a, a lot of time in. That's really how I got where I am today in terms of uh, you know, the career moves you see uh, post the first Cisco stint. Yeah, and so uh, it's, it, what's changed in you know if you, in, in twenty years of what you just were talking about is it is it still uh, the same? Like you know what this is what we got to do. There's more budgets, obviously. There's more money being spent on cybersecurity. I remember when I started uh, LogicKeep in '97 because I was raising money at the time. Uh, it was a billion dollar industry. Information security, as it, you know, it was then called, it was a billion dollar industry for the first time wow. in, in 1997. And so I was pitching money, and there were there were uh, sources of capital. Uh, I get turned down a lot before I was successful raising money. And but some of the people said it's too niche, it's too small. You know, your industry, oh, your sure. total industry is only a billion. We're looking for products that have a billion dollar market possibility, let alone an entire <laughs> industry. You know, and now of course, in that same span of years, it's gone from a billion to you know quarter trillion or whatever wherever it is now, somewhere in that in that neighborhood. Um, you know. Is it, so is it still solution selling? I mean, are those techniques and things you learned uh, early on, are those still the, the things today? Well, you know, the, the big, I would say yes. Overall, uh, solution selling is still like a, um, you know, something that has to be a systematic process. And the, and there's, everyone's embracing this thing called MedPIC. Uh, won't go into it, but it essentially is uh, a systematic way of ensuring that your team is solution selling. But what's still, there's still a gap. And, and this is what's fascinating, fascinating and frustrating all at the same time, which is, uh, let's go back to 2003, 2004. I'm, I'm selling Jack Jones, the author of the FAIR model, which we'll get into a little bit, and saying, hey, I've got this great business case for this endpoint security solution. And he looked at my business case. He says, that's pretty good. Come into my office, right? And he asked me, so what's the risk reduction benefit of your solution? Uh, I said, well, you know, it's obviously going to reduce risk, but I have no way of knowing the answer to that question. <laughs> quantifying it, yeah. <laughs> That's right. So he goes to his whiteboard and shows me how to quantify the risk reduction benefit of my, the solution I'm selling. And I sit back and think, holy cow, this guy's got the holy grail of cybersecurity sales. If I can quantify that, that's the cornerstone of my business case. Honestly, what good is a cybersecurity solution if it's not affecting risk? It's it's really a doorstop at that point. It's you know it, it's that's the pro fundamental you know aspect of the value proposition. I embraced that. It was like wow, this I need to understand this, and I need to incorporate this into my sales process. When was that? Do you remember the year? That was two thousand three. That was you know, twenty years ago. Twenty years ago. Yeah. And let's just fast forward to today. Do you know that uh, in the industry, I'll speak generally, because I'm speaking as business of security today, not Cisco, <laughs> that I know of no one in the, and I'm sure there's somebody out there, but there's no solution sellers offering a, even an estimate as to the cost benefit of their solution when it comes to affecting risk. Now, you know, you can go to Forrester or somebody and get a total economic impact study, and they'll give you a very rudimentary uh, and almost indefensible uh, quantitative value of that. But so here we are 20 years later, and it's still not like an accepted normal practice to say, well, here's our effect on risk. This is how we, you know, either reduce the, the probability that bad things going to happen. So it's, although I will say, 
it's coming of age, right? There's a whole lot more business drivers for this. And I think I'm, you know, it was, it wasn't just me, but, you know, those that were promoting and are advocating for quantitative risk analysis and cybersecurity back in the uh, 2003 to even the 2015 timeframe were considered snake oil salesmen. <laughs> dark, well, let's, practicing I, I, the dark art. Let's get into that because I think that's an area that you're you're uniquely positioned to shed light on. I mean, I, I hadn't realized 20 years of sort of meeting Jack and, and looking how FAIR worked. And and uh, I know you've had roles. I mean, your your role at Caterpillar was all about risk quantification. I mean, that's specifically what you were doing there. It's probably been, a, like you said, you've woven it into everything you do, no matter what role you've had to help you or be a tool. But you've also had roles that were only about it. And you are, it's safe to say, you know, I, I think in my opening monologue of introducing you, I didn't say, um, you know, a fair evangelist, but you are. You yeah. And you know a lot about it. Uh, and, and I think it'd be interesting to talk about its application in the OT industry uh, or OT side of the, sure. you know, the side of the house as a nuance or maybe not a nuance, maybe, you know, a different, uh, maybe, you know, how different is it is a question I'd have for you. But maybe you introduce it. Maybe we should do first is introduce what FAIR is. There could be certainly listeners who are not yet familiar okay. with it. Uh, so FAIR is an acronym. It stands for Factor Analysis of Information Risk. And it's a, in the end, it really is an agnostic model for defining how risk works, uh, breaking down the basic elements that define risk and how those elements interact with each other. So uh, while it, it was developed by uh, the chief information security officer at Nationwide Insurance, really to answer the, the question uh, that we were posing here, which is how much risk reduction benefit uh, does this initiative or program provide and what's the cost? So you can get a cost benefit uh, analysis done. And uh, so that was the, the problem, you know, that had to be addressed. And so what the model thrives on is the uncertainty of data. So if you think back in 2003, five, we didn't have the DBIR, we didn't have all this great, you know, call it semi-actuarial data to fall back on. It was mostly subject matter experts estimating what might happen that hasn't happened before. So the model is stochastic, meaning it's using uh, variable inputs and essentially saying, well, there's a lot of uncertainty in what we're doing, but let's let's represent that uncertainty in an accurate way and factor it into our um, calculations. So it's uh, back in you know cybersecurity in 2005 is very similar to industrial cybersecurity today where you've got a very low frequency of, of true cyber instance within an industrial environment. And so a lot of times you're trying to estimate how much risk you know, is associated with something that's never happened in this environment. So just to summarize, FAIR is a model, right? And the, a model to quantify risk in financial terms, and it leads you to the data you need in order to do that. And then there's a computational aspect of it. You know, you have to use the you know, statistical science and math to do put your inputs in. Uh, so they're essentially, you know, the tools that a good risk analyst can use to quantify cyber risk in financial terms, or for that matter, operational risk, any risk basically. Uh, but its application was first in now what we call cybersecurity. Is that a good explanation there, Derek? Did you? Yeah, and, you know, I, yeah. I've, I, as a, you know, non-expert in this, have referenced uh, other people's comments and works, and probably some of them things you've said to me in the past about about this. And I've, I've just done a layman's version of you need to quantify your risks, you know, without specifically pointing anybody to one, you know, one methodology or, or whatever. I just said we don't have enough. I mean, what's true? What's clearly evidence? We don't have enough time, resources, money to do everything. So prioritization is the key. Yeah, and you, right. And you, then you've got a choice to make. Do we randomly prioritize? Do we go with what's cheapest? No. What are we going to mitigate? And you're, what you're talking about is a, uh, a sophisticated methodology for saying, okay, we're going to have to make some guesses, but what if we made them within a framework and, uh, and they were uniform? I and mean, when we make another set of guesses, right. we're using the same framework and we keep refining that. And so if we do have to make prioritization, we're not making random. We're not guessing at what to do next. 
we're going to pick this project that we're going to do next because it is the best it's the best place to spend the limited resources we have it's going to mitigate not necessarily the most damaging risk because you guys take into effect frequency or likelihood i mean it's it's, a, right. it's an equation it's not just like oh man if this if scenario x happened it would cost us a billion dollars yeah but what's the likelihood of a scenario x oh you have to have a lightning storm and you have to have somebody outstanding holding up their hand uh, and you have to have somebody on the phone with them also in kansas touching another lever oh my god it's not likely to happen that might not be the risk you choose to mitigate that day uh, but there could be something else that maybe doesn't have a billion dollars but has a high likelihood and it, it can happen multiple times well i got that up to a lot of money really quickly maybe that's the one you choose to go after is that is that a fair reason why to to to, to you know have a discipline in a system like this oh yeah so you yeah you brought up some great points which is uh you know having a, a framework for we'll call it critical thinking and you know having a you know so i'm an electrical engineer i was trained to think uh analytically and critically uh and this model would i right really appeals like the principal engineer in a power plant you know it, when i present the model it's like yes that makes sense right it's intuitive and so it gives you a construct then to think through problems so you don't necessarily have to always go down the path of the quantification piece but at least it puts everybody on the same page to say this is what risk is right here's the weakness that we're concerned about and this is where it resides you know in the model and this is how it affects risk and let's talk about it right and so now we're all on the same page talking about the same thing and coming to at least a you know a consensus of opinion and then if it warrants you invest more time and you actually start you get handed over to a risk analyst and say hey tell us you know more let, let's dig into this deeper right that's yeah. that was my role at caterpillar yeah but, and, and you're doing risk uh risk modeling and risk-based methodology now at cisco i am yeah so it's yeah it's a, so rewind a little bit i'm at abb i'm sitting in a office of a plant manager of course actually he was kind of the we'll call it the lead engineer for all the plants and i bring to his attention that he hasn't updated his microsoft patches on his uh, servers of his abp control dcs for, since it was installed right five years and you know uh, and i'm i'm in a sales role but i'm also you know somewhat there to be an advisor and i tell him that you know probably a good idea to install these patches and he kind of slams his hand on the table bite yeah he's gravelly voice he goes reliability is king he says there's no way anybody's touching those servers because that is one hell of a complicated control system unfortunately he had probably a, a case there it was the 800 you know x version of the, of the control system and he goes you're even your Technicians won't even touch those things and patch them. You know, he said, "Hey, you know what? I that started my quest to say, you know, he, he could be right. You know, nothing's happened bad in the last five years because every single Microsoft Patch Tuesday's come and gone. He's done nothing, and he hasn't had a problem. I bet if he had he tried to apply all five years worth of patches, he probably had an outage. <laughs> so, but then it." You know, on the flip side, an unplanned outage, if he did have a thumb drive event and that system went down unexpectedly, he would have had a, not only a major major outage, but then he would have had a cybersecurity event. He would have had a report up to NERC and he would have made the news, right? It would have been oh, the first cybersecurity incident that takes down a power plant in the United States that would have had him. And so I began to analyze, well, what what's worse or what's again what's what's the probability question what's the probability of successfully deploying your microsoft patches uh versus having it you know a a blue screen uh versus and what would be the the fallout from yeah let's say a patch takes down your your dc shouldn't take down dc i should take down your you know a a backup you know, console or something, if you did it right. But anyway, uh, versus an unplanned outage from a cybersecurity incident. And 
you know, it, it began, you know, applying the fair model to say, well, right, let's compare the two, you know, let's look at it. Maybe you are right. Maybe I'm wrong. That's um, interesting. I've never thought about this. You're, what, what's there is there's the, the leader's methodology for justifying taking some risk doing something that's going to potentially yeah. some risk, but doing it as as opposed to not taking this risk. We're going to take risk A, not risk B, and here's how those two work together. So it's a way for someone who wants to do something that is going to not be risk-free. It's a way to justify it, explain it, communicate it. So what are most uh, risk decisions based on? Gut, feel, and experience. Yeah. I, I've been, in a, been doing this I job for 30 years, years, right? But that's not very defendable. That can come back to hurt you. <laughs> well, and there's plenty of studies that show that intuition and the you know our mental models that we go certainly it may not be taking into account the current threat landscape and you know what what the future is going to look like. You, know, you look at the last five years, you got some good data points, but then you have to project out what's the next next five years going to look like. And we can even look at our industry. We've got that rearview mirror. We can look back and say. Well, five years ago, ransomware was a thing, but it wasn't a thing for us, you know, industrial side of the house. And and now it actually is, you know. And so you've got a a concern there in terms of being able to have some threat intelligence and understand how these things are going to affect you in the future. Hey everybody, Derek Harp here. And I just want to take a brief moment to thank three companies that make this podcast series possible. The first company is Waterfall Security Solutions. They led the charge this year for the podcast, and they specifically sponsored it from their podcast, the Industrial Security Podcast. So check that out. That's a great linkage to an entire other series of over 100 episodes. They had their anniversary recently, focused on control system cybersecurity. And they were supported this year by KPMG and Fortinet. We could not do this without them. These companies not only have supported this podcast series this year, but they've supported CSA since its very early days eight years ago. And we're entirely grateful to the teams and dedicated professionals at Waterfall Security Solutions, KPMG, and Fortinet. So how is FAIR being applied in the OT environments? Well, I would say that it's uh, it's popping up here and there, so it's not pervasive. But uh, you know, if you take a, uh, a methodology that people are familiar with, you know, the uh, fault tree analysis or... Uh, any one of the, you know, here's the threats, here's the consequences, you know, and you match those up, bow tie, you could say what's not being done in that process is really calculating the probability aspect of it and then modeling the risk associated with these threats and these consequences. Uh, so there's, I think, aligning those with like a process hazard analysis, PHA, and align with how their risk outcomes are for the you know the other process hazards in equating the cyber threats to the impact level that these other threats pose is a good step but then uh, being able to answer that probability question i think is still fundamentally not being done and that's where you know a quantitative risk analysis would add value uh, so that you could Again, you know, equally compare, all right, here's all the hazards to our process, all our threats to our process, I should say. And uh, here's here's how cyber threats rank against all you know, the 10 other things that could take our plant down. And so what recommendation do you make to someone, let's say uh, a listener who is interested in this and, and has very little or no working knowledge of, uh, of of this model or these models in general, where do they start? How do they begin to work this into their thought process, vocabulary, let alone adopt something? Right. So great question because it's, um, you know, there's a way to uh, grasp the understanding just by, you know, reading the documentation. So you can go to the open group is the the certification authority and the the one that owns the standard. So the open group. So if you go open group, you know dot com, it's get a free uh, login, and then you look up open fair, you know f a i r, and then you get to what they're calling the fair body of knowledge, and you'll see probably a dozen different documents there that uh, you've got the standards. There's two standards that you could you'll see the risk taxonomy and the risk analysis standards. 
And then there's supporting documentation, and that's the, the body of knowledge. And so I would start there. You would, again, it's very, I would say, very readable. It's not highly technical. And I think you will, again, find it somewhat intuitive. And that's a great starting point. Awesome. Yeah, I'm glad that, uh, that you shared that because I think that's a really uh, cool walk away. And I always love every one of these interviews. There's been a couple of like that you like to call gold nuggets and there's something somebody can grab a hold of and, and do something with. And there's their uh, how to start investigating this uh, or, you know, that you got right to it and they can go right and go right there and do it. So that's, yeah. that's cool. Yeah, he, um, he brought up my experience at Caterpillar. I That was uh, going from sales and business development into a practitioner role. And so that was a, an opportunity for me to bring into practice the things I had learned in the previous 15 years and say, how good am I as a risk analyst? Can I really you know, employ this and make this work in a real organization, certainly with industrial uh, applications as well as IT applications? And it was, uh, I spent a good year and a half there and had the opportunity to do some very interesting uh, analyze some variants of cyber risk issues and to operationalize FAIR within the uh, cybersecurity organization, the DRC organization. And there's a lot of lessons learned from that. And one is that um, you know, getting people to communicate effectively on this topic of cyber risk is probably the first uh, step you should take you know, if you're advocating for a risk model, because, you know, I'm dealing with this uh, cybersecurity engineers and their terminology is based on almost like a, you know, I don't know, like a tribe. You got your slang and your lingo and a vulnerability and a risk to them aren't necessarily clearly defined. And, and the terms risk, vulnerability, threat are interchangeably, you know, used interchangeably. And so when a, a policy violation is called a risk, you know, a, a CVE is called a risk. And so there's a lack of ability to, you know, talk the same language, even within, we'll call it the cybersecurity organization, you know, which would encompass GRC. And so we, we had to land on, an, you know, hey, let's, let's all talk the same language here so that we can better collaborate and this will be true in the OT world. It's like there is this mystification between cybersecurity and, and controls engineers. Right? They, I had many of those conversations, and they certainly understand their process and their equipment and their turbines. But when it came to cyber, you know, that was like, well, that's kind of more relatable to their personal use of computers as opposed to the environment they're working in. And so it was a great to essentially. Say, well, let's let's talk about it this way, and I would put forth the model. Yeah, that's another a great, you know, very compatible with with the you know CSA, which is sort of a bridge building, you know, association. Like, let's get on the same page. I find myself making comments like that around that all the time, and yeah. having the same words, having the same vocabulary. That's part of that uh, about the trust building, bridge building that these factions or groups, whatever you want to call them, you know, different stakeholders, and even in the same enterprise. Um, if we, you know, we do need to, to use the same language. And I've heard so many mature cyber leaders saying, you know, learn the language of, of talking about risk. You're bored. They, that's how they talk. Even if they haven't been talking about cyber risk as long, they've been talking about risks. And I've right. had risk officers, you know, risks meaning everything, hurricanes, you know, lots of risk categories, uh, natural disasters. They've been talking about risk for a long time. There's a maturity in talking about certain kinds of risk. And now cyber risk is obviously on the table it's got to be in the in the portfolio of risk and so learning how people talk about that if especially if you have to bridge from maybe you're not a practitioner anymore but you're going to be talking to c level or to the board uh you, you know it, learning the vocabulary they already use is going to be key to effective being an effective oh, yeah yeah. Presenter yeah. Them. yeah you have the chance of being highly credible or being discredited if you if you misuse their terms yeah uh, if, so, you know, if a CFO misuses the terms asset and credit and debit, you know, you throw them out of the boardroom, right? Yeah. And yeah. so, yeah. So if, uh, if someone who's trying to communicate uh, how much risk is associated with our OT infrastructure, 
you know, they would be uh, well advised to come in with a uh, educated understanding of risk. And in fact, that's really the language you, you need to talk uh, to the executives in because they really don't care about cybersecurity. They care about risk. Yeah, how much is it? And, you know, uh, how much does it cost to mitigate it? And they'll make a decision whether it's a risk issue that they really are concerned about, but they have bigger things on their plate than what you brought to them. I think this is a big takeaway in this conversation too, because I know we could have a lot of listeners in lots and lots of different roles, but even if you were going to go implement a framework like FAIR, which is not in your job path, career path, but you are communicating to anybody outside of cybersecurity about cybersecurity, even studying some of the FAIR documentation you pointed people to could give you some of that common framework language, right? And and so whatever right, communication yeah. you're doing would benefit from this. Uh, I have certainly heard, I think we all have heard sometimes what I would call pure play technologists speaking to a room or speaking to a group and you instantly know they've got their technology blinders on and it's about features and functions and oh, uh, right, it's, yeah. it's quickly not effective. Doesn't mean anything what they were saying wasn't right. Doesn't mean that it wasn't technically very interesting. Um, I can try to wear that hat and get what they're saying, but I realize they're creening off course without realizing it because it, their audience, that doesn't matter to them, or they're not even going to be able to absorb, you know, what's being being shared. It's not in their language yeah. and it's not the the risk lens is a powerful, uh, a powerful way of looking at it and uh, justifying projects. It's uh, the fair play yeah. day of like, we got to do all this is over. <laughs> we can't do it all. <laughs> There's so many attack surfaces. There's so many projects. So it, it comes down to having a way of deciding, right? I mean, that's that's it's, key. That is key, yeah. You know, I'll throw something out for your audience. Just you know, one of, another takeaway you know, when we're talking about risk is to understand that risk is a derived value, right? It's You can't point to something and say, oh, that's, a, that's risk. Um, it's very much like speed. So you, you can't point to a car and say, oh, that, that's, that's speed. It's... Um, what uh, distance over time, right? Miles per hour. And so you measure speed by the observations you make of this thing in motion. And risk is identical, it's a computation. So risk is, um, has to be derived. So if you have a control weakness, that's not a risk. If you have a, a threat actor, that's not a risk. Uh, uh, risk is always measured, uh, based on a defined scenario. So you say this, what's the probability of this threat actor, you know, coming through my firewall, getting to my DCS and um, causing a, we'll call it a lack of availability of the DCS, which would then result in an unplanned uh, shutdown, planned shutdown. So once I, once you define that scenario to me, now I can analyze the probable you know frequency of that bad thing happening you know we can measure that and then we can multiply it by the probable outcomes you know it's there's gonna be a range of potential bad things that could happen and so then then you derive risk and so it's you know generally speaking it's exposure to loss and it's a derived value so you, know, you take that away and, and you become sensitive then to how the terms are used and uh, ultimately, you can become kind of a risk snob, you know? It's like, no, yeah, don't call that a risk. It's not a risk, right? <laughs> I'm, I'm a risk snob. Uh, well, you know, so I should, have, I should have added that to my introduction of you, you know? Dog, right. Lover of dogs and cigars and risk snob. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I, my projection is that given the, the CISO is more and more taking over uh, responsibility for industrial cybersecurity and industrial cyber risk, that these methodologies are actually being applied today. Quantitative risk analysis is, is more mainstream in the financial services industry. You know, IBM and the big four all have consulting practices to quantify cyber risk. It's becoming more mainstream. It's just a matter of, uh, you know, can, is it factoring into your decision process like you're illustrating? Do I need more insight into my prioritization because I can't fix everything? So, so I think you'll see this um, becoming more of a it's common practice 
within our industry as, uh, of course, we're going after looking for insurance against uh, you know the, this to ensure the outcomes of a, a cyber incident. So somebody's going to have to quantify you know this. You know the carrier and the underwriters are certainly looking at ways to, to quantify this. So it's it's coming, uh, and I think again, it's, as you said, it's a way to better communicate up the, the food chain and uh, ensure that uh, what, what the common practice or phrases was, those guys up there, they don't get it. Management doesn't get it, right? Patrol engineers say, this is going to be a disaster, <laughs> right? And it, it's evident to everyone, you can't do this. You can't, you know, this is going to, you know, it's a bad thing. And there's a lot of frustration, high and sea side of the house, at least anybody that's involved with cybersecurity that management doesn't get it. They just don't get it. And so, uh, but management understands risk. The more you understand it at that level, the better you can be able to communicate your your concerns. And maybe your concerns are overblown. You know, you have to determine yeah. that. Well, Mike, thank you so much. I'm glad we we ended up in sort of spending more time on this sort of framework. Um, and I know that's your your area of, of great expertise and passion. And we may have to have you do a uh, do some sort of workshop uh, just on that alone. Um, I could see us having a lot of people in our community you know, approaching 30,000 now members signed up. It just, I'm sure many of them do not have working knowledge of what you were, you know, highlighting today. Yeah. And that might be something that we should do. So thank you for coming on today and for being a, a longtime chapter leader of the CSA chapter in Columbus, Ohio. That's right. Um, you, you know, you, that's uh, something that uh, I don't know who can say they've been on chapter, one of our chapter boards as long as you have consistently. And so you're, I know you're part of the process of uh, bringing the Columbus chapter back online after COVID. And uh, so thank you for all of that and for the years of, uh, of friendship and, and working, you know, working in our, in our industry. I know we skipped over the, the whole backstory of the Derek and Mike meeting, but we'll have to save that for another episode. But uh, yeah, our CSA chapter meets next week. So first time in three years. So we're very yeah. excited to get everybody back together. We got a very strong board and Again, bringing the community together here. We've got uh, Intel building a plant. We've got manufacturing in Ohio. Is, you know, it's it's big. So yeah, we've got a lot of a lot of opportunity to contribute to the community here. Yeah, and, and you know what? Maybe we do an episode um, with you and and Doug and a few others, and just talk about chapter rebooting. And we shared that as a resource with a lot of other people out there looking at how do I get my chapter going or going again in the case of, of some COVID impacts. Um, right. You guys, you, you know, I'm, I'm on, you You know, copied you, you've copied me on a lot of your communications. It's really amazing to see what's happening and the group you guys have, have brought together, You're already sort of grooming a next generation of leaders and just really cool. So, yeah, looking, for this. looking forward to that. So, yeah, it's been, uh, uh, it's been fun. Yeah, and it's again giving back to the community. It's got to be an aspect of your career. So always get involved in professional associations. Make the time, and, uh, and don't just be a you know what you call it, a consumer. Be a contributor. Well, that's great. Great words of wisdom to uh, to end on. Uh, and there is great value in in giving to the community, and it comes back tenfold. I think there's some there's yeah. some old sayings and things out there about that, but it is true. Well, we come to my favorite part of the, of these, which is uh, where I borrow from uh, a television show that I really enjoyed for years, Inside the Actor's Studio, where they, uh, the host, James Lipton, who is uh, now passed on, host, uh, he would interview the greatest actors and actresses of, uh, of the time on his stage at the acting school in New York. And he ended the interview with this questionnaire called the Pavot Questionnaire, which he borrowed from a French show. I, it's got to be 30, 40, 50 years old. I don't wow. know. And so I have not altered a word of it. It is the same uh, same questionnaire that he used, and apparently they use. So if you're up for it, we'll I'll, I'll end with the uh, Pavo questionnaire. Well, never heard of the Inside Actor Studio, but happy to participate. Yeah. All right. What is your favorite word? Uh, possibilities. It's almost a fault. I love exploring the possibilities. My wife can't pin me down sometimes, you know. <laughs> <laughs> what is your least favorite word? So I would say this is more like a pet peeve that my least favorite word probably changes. But the one that's irritating me right now is look, you know, the talking heads. Look, 
that's how they all they always start their their conversation with uh look now you know it's it's like don't tell me to look i'm getting frustrated with that <laughs> what turns you on creatively spiritually or emotionally exploring mysteries yeah i still want that you know metal detector i still i want to be a you know i want to solve mysteries what turns you off yeah and this this is probably more professional but um there's a saying do what you say you're going to do dizzy wood some people call it any people that don't do what they say they're going to do and it's honestly more prevalent now than ever before what is your favorite curse word <laughs> or <laughs> Son of a nut tractor. <laughs> <laughs> what sound or noise do you love? Mm, sizzling steak on the grill. Love that sound. What sound or noise do you hate? So unfortunately, I live pretty close to uh, I-71. And on Wednesday nights, they got the, you know, the motorcycle nights. I hate the sound of these motorcycles i don't know what the crotch rockets they go they they're so damn loud uh, what profession other than your own would you like to attempt welcome to my late night fm radio station show derek come and join me for an evening of soft music and relaxing sounds yeah, you know, you've <laughs> got you've got radio voice or podcast voice in this case you you know you've got that deep resonant tone i mean so I need to make money off that somehow. Uh, what profession would you like to not do? All right, so I'm really thankful for these people, but I would never do it being a dentist. And if heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you arrive at the pearly gates? Mr. Radigan, we were expecting you. Uh, we have your reservation, and it's paid for in full. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've just finished sending up a great podcast with Mike Radigan. He is the uh, Cisco uh, risk, cyber risk advisor at Cisco Systems and a uh, FAIR enthusiast. We talked a lot about that today and, and a longtime contributor to uh, cost-effective cyber risk management uh, methodologies. Uh, long-time contributor to our community and to, to uh, CSA specifically from its very early days. Uh, thank you for all of that and for preparing to come on today and for everything you do. Hey, thanks for having me, Derek. And I will say I, I name you as one of my mentors. I really appreciate all that you've done for my career and, and really you are responsible for getting me into OT, uh, cybersecurity industry. Well, I remember uh, remember the, the, what you're referencing there in our early calls and you jumping right uh, right into my one of my projects. And I, uh, yes, when it was nascent and, uh, you know, TBD for sure, and you were, there you were. So I always, yeah. I, that's, a, that's a special place in my heart for anybody willing to do that, so. Thank you for that, and uh, I'm glad we're uh, our paths continue to cross over the years. Yes, sir. Yeah. So, cheers, Derek. Have a good one. Take care. We'll be well. Hi, everyone. This is Derek Harp, the founder and chairman of the Control System Cybersecurity Association International, or as we call it, just CSE. CSE is a 501c6 nonprofit workforce development association dedicated to helping grow, support, and sustain the professionals charged with the cybersecurity of control systems. We're specifically talking about those systems that have pumps and valves and actuators, real cyber to physical moving parts and control nearly every aspect of our modern connected industries. Thank you for tuning into the podcast. It is my hope you find it inspirational or motivating or revealing or informative, and perhaps at times even a little entertaining. Take care and be well.